of you who have been here before, thanks for coming back. And if it's your first time, we hope to see you again. We hope to continue the program, the presentations, even though um, Pastor Berg has left, we hope that we can continue this. So thank you so much for your interest in it. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. The restrooms are in the back. Um, we're going to be stopping whenever the sharks feel that it's a good stopping point, maybe about an hour in. And so at that time, we'll have maybe 10 to 15 minutes uh, to go get more to drink or to use the restroom or to get some fresh air if you want to. So um, I think that's about it. I just have a little intro that Pastor Berg had written. He really wishes he could be here because I understand you guys are good friends. You want to prove that? I uh, mean, <laughs> <laughs> he did give me his um, cleaned up version, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which is much shorter than what he had. Okay, so David and Beth Sharp are both graduates of Martin Luther College in New Ulm, Minnesota. After David finished his seminary studies and Beth finished teaching in Watertown, Wisconsin, the Sharps served Emmanuel Lutheran in Greenville, Wisconsin for about a decade. They now reside in New Ulm where David teaches theology at their alma mater. They are here to speak about being a Christian family. They both come from large Lutheran homes and have created one of their own. Please help me welcome David and Beth. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be here. Um, why don't we start, see if this will click down. It was working before. It's not gonna work. Old fashioned here. All right, let's start with, let's start with a prayer. For Christian homes, O oh Lord, we pray that you might dwell, dwell with us each day. Make ours a place where you are Lord, where all is governed by your word. And when you call us all to rest, then will we have a home more blessed. See all our care and sorrows cease, and find with Christ eternal peace. Amen. All right. So um, I'll just do a little intro, and you, you just tell me whatever you want. Like, you cut me off. Okay. That's, that's great. Okay. Just like it's been in my Right, right. So um, as was, I, I'm Dave. Um, that's me. And then my beautiful wife, Beth. Um, Beth, her main name is Kalpine, so I don't know if you're familiar with like Arnold Kalpine, so that would be my father-in-law, her dad. Um, Paul Kalpine would be her brother, and I was dating her when I had Paul for class, and my friends did not make that awkward at all, including, <laughs> including Pastor Berg, by the way, if he's watching this. Um, we have six wonderful children. Anastasia is our oldest one. She's going into high school this next year. Um, and then Zoe, so Anastasia and Zoe, their names mean resurrection and life. So we've got the resurrection and the life. And then we've got Isaiah, um, our only boy, six, five girls, one boy. So he's gonna make an awesome husband someday. Um, and he is super sweet. And then we've got Dahlia. Doesn't she look cute? She wants you to believe she's cute. She's the closest thing to the devil spawn that we have. <laughs> I will say nice things about her, Dory. Um, Evangeline, that's a terrible picture of her because she is super cute um, and she's a snuggler, but um, there she is. And then we've got Nika. You see how she's trying to struggle out of Beth's arms? Um, we call her Nika the Destroyer because um, she, she destroys things. That's why we call her that. Um, so anytime, she's one of those kids that anytime you don't hear her, you have to run. Run right away. So there was a time we didn't hear her, and then we went into the living room where we had just gotten these awesome brand new hardwood floors, and she found the Sharpies. Um, so, true or false, Sharpie comes out of hardwood floor. It's actually true. It's really easy. Here's what it doesn't come out of, cloth furniture. <laughs> Although I'm kind of wondering, she wanted new stuff for a long time. <laughs> I'm wondering if she ran in there quick. <laughs> <laughs> so those are, those are our children. Um, I am part of a, a, a big family. My mom and dad um, have 14 kids, so I am number seven. Once you get past six kids, you just go by numbers. So I'm number seven. Um, <laughs> I go by Angie, or John, or Nate, or Cindy, sometimes Dave. Um, so the, the joke for my parents was, or my dad, my dad's friends would tease him. They'd say, Ralph, we know that God said fill the earth and to do it, but he didn't mean you had to do it by yourself. So that's, that's his, um, his thing. Anyway, we've got, I don't even know how many, this is sad, I don't know how many nephews and nieces. I could figure it out. I don't know how many it's at right now. I haven't counted in a while. 
So I, no, it's not quite that high. It's like 43? You're way better with that. Maybe it is 48. I think it's like 43 going on 46. I don't, something like that. So anyway, that's big family. Um, I'm gonna let, I'll, I'll keep going through that. This is, this was our church family at Emmanuel in Greenville. Um, we, like we said, we spent 11 years there uh, and we absolutely loved it. Uh, if you don't know, that's from, that's at night. Sorry, there you go. Um, if you don't know where Greenville is, it's right there, and apparently we're kind of a big deal. We have our own t-shirts, so. Um, anyway, then I just finished my first year of teaching this, this past year at Martin Luther College. I teach the theology courses, so like doctrine one and two, and the Bible overview courses and things like that. Just having an absolute blast. And then Beth, I'm gonna, go ahead, you talk for a while. All right, so as my husband was the uh, troubled middle child of 14, I was what my husband or my parents refer to as the special blessing at the end, or as some people refer to it as, whoops. Yeah. Um, I came 11 years after my youngest brother. Um, and my youngest brother, John, married the oldest Sharf, married Becky. This is totally legal. scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> Dave and I walked down the aisle together for their wedding when we were 13 years old. <laughs> um, notice how excited I am and how not excited Dave is. <laughs> um, uh, little did we know then, but God certainly knew that 10 years later on the same day in the same church we would walk down the aisle for husband and wife. Um, yeah, so uh, six, six blessings later and here we are. All right, so that's that's our fun fact. We won't go around the room. I bet you all have fun facts. <laughs> Not that one. Um, okay, disclaimer. Obviously, yeah, we're we're Christians. We're parents, Christian parents. So of course we would present. Not that we don't have our doctorates in um, familial studies. Is that something? <laughs> Is that a thing? I don't know. Um, but I, we, we certainly have God's word and and, um, and some neat experiences uh, with our parents and and of course with our kids. Um, okay, I like corny things, and I like you guys to kind of like be engaged a little bit, and you're nodding your head like that is corny. Yes, I am going to make you do this. Um, okay, <laughs> you don't have to. I'd like you to. All right, no, take, just take a minute. Come up with a bumper sticker slogan illustrating a truth about Christian parenting. You can brainstorm with your neighbor. You don't have to come up with your own. One minute. <laughs> By the way, I'm also going to make you write a haiku. I just want to warn you now. <laughs> I'm serious, actually. I'm going to. So, all right. One minute. One minute starts now. Go. What, what profound wisdom in a bumper sticker did we find? What did you come up with? I borrowed this one, but it was a, a black sign. It said, come on over and listen to Jesus. Yeah. And it was like, come on over and bring the kids. Sign God. Nice. That's way better than the ones I came up with. <laughs> <laughs> I took way more than a minute trying to get ready for this, too. Oh, that was good. Give me another one. Anyone else? Jesus died for middle children, too. Oh, I love that one. Jesus died for middle children, too. Oh, that's my bumper sticker. Oh, that's great. All right, one more. One more. Yes? Love my kids, but Jesus left in the boat for a reason. Oh, oh say, I love my kids, but? Jesus left in the boat for a reason. Nice. I like that one, too. I like that one, too. Nice. Are those originals? Those are really good. I think we could sell those. I'm not even going to give you mine. Yours are so much better. All right, let's, um, let's look at what, what we're going to do is we're just going to go through some root sinking tips. and We're going to look at some principles. We're going to tell some stories and that kind of thing. So uh, sinking, root sinking tip number one, um, teach Jesus. Kind of seems obvious. By the way, that's Evie. Um, that's Jesus. But that one's our daughter. We don't know them. Um, but anyway... Uh, the passage says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not turn from it. Is that obvious? 
Yeah, yeah, I guess it's obvious, right? Like everybody would say it. Every Christian parent says it. Of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach Jesus, right? Um, the problem is how we actually live it out. Um, and we're... Sorry, honey. She's perfect. I am not perfect at this. <laughs> um, it, it, comes, it comes to priority, right? So let's just real quick, who are the, who are the people priority in our lives? Um, who's number one? This is a confirmation answer. Go ahead. God, very good. Number one. Number two? Spouse. Number three? Children. You can argue a little bit, but you're a spouse first. Um, and, by the way, I would say this. Why do, you, why do you think that most marriage counseling happens after, like, 18 months or 25 years? Why do you think after 25 years? The kids are gone, and all of a sudden you look at each other and you go, who are you again? Right? And, and so um, that relationship you have to work. All right, so uh, spouse, kids. I like to call them our little idols. Um, number four, I mean, it's true, the way sometimes um, people act. Number four would be, I'm going to make this easy for you, everything else, everyone else, right? Including, and this is one that we're going to especially relate to in our culture, I'm going to include not just friends and hobbies and things like that, but work. Work comes after those other three. Um, oh boy, pot calling the kettle black if I'm criticizing anyone for this one. Um, but this is our culture. We went to school together. Actually, this is where we kind of really got to know each other. Went to school together in um, Anbaler, Germany. And Anbaler was on a big mountain. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we didn't have a car, and so we would walk down into town. Together. Together. <laughs> I always liked it when she walked with me. It was very nice. But we would walk down into town together. And um, I don't know, I'm maybe a slow learner, but. I, w I went down there after classes like three times it took me to figure this out. I would go down there at maybe like 12.30. I've got a break for an hour or two. Um, I'm going to go get some things from the grocery store and then I'm going to go walk back up the mountain, which was ridiculously hard. Um, and then I would get down there and everything's closed at 12.30. Do you know why? I did not know Germans take a siesta. They really do. They don't call it a siesta, but that's what they do. They take... They, they are open from like 8.30 or 9, and the smaller cities, 8.30 or 9 in the morning until 12, 12.30, and then they take two hours off, and then, and then they open up at 2.30, and then they close at 4.30 or 5. And as an American, I looked at them, and I went, you are lazy. lazy. <laughs> the longer I live, the more I realize, I think they might have had it right, and we have it wrong, right? Um, and, and the devil's really good at what he does, so he takes the work, and he workaholics in our country and he puts that on top and then the next comes our little idols the kids and the next comes the spouse and then the next comes God you see how good the devil is at what he does flips it and so this is not as obvious a point um, as, as we think it is uh, St. Augustine talked about the, the order of goods and he called God the summum bonum the highest good and he said anything you put above God is evil even, even if it's good so do you understand this concept so like let's say little Johnny this is your little Johnny I don't have a little Johnny, but you've got a little Johnny. Um, and little Johnny is playing hockey, and he wants to go play in a tournament on Sunday. And it's just the next four Sundays, but that's the only day you have church. And little Johnny really wants to go. Do you love Johnny? You do. And so because you love Johnny, you let him go to the hockey, right? Uh-oh. There are an awful lot that would make that choice, right? But what have you just taught Johnny? God is there for you when? It's convenient, it's convenient for you. And now you have just set in motion a pattern that could lead to, to eternity consequences, right? Um, and so this concept of teach Jesus, maybe it's more than that, it's prioritize Jesus, right? Um, yeah, so, okay. Sorry. Go I ahead. Said, yeah. you, you would say things. I've <laughs> no. talked too much. I no, said too many not things. at all. Um, probably, you know, a personal story for me is um, when we first found out that we were expecting a child, um, I was a little terrified. I had my middle child of seven here who is Mr. Mom, but I basically grew up an only child, and I didn't really know how to change a diaper or care for a baby. And I just remember my mother looking at me and saying, love your children and teach them about Jesus, and everything else will fall into place. And that always stuck in the forefront of my mind, but as my husband said, all those other things can very much get in the way of that. Um, and what I find myself as a mother oftentimes getting in the middle of is what things are important to your family and to your children? Is it important that they go to Disney World in their lifetime? Is it important that they play a sport at some point? Is it important that they do this, this, this? 
really when we strip that all away, it basically comes down to exactly what number one, isn't it? Um, that we teach them about Jesus. I was at a funeral of an infant once, and the pastor started the sermon by saying, well, you did it. You got one home. And isn't that what every parent wants in the end? Is that you have the responsibility of these gifts to teach them about Jesus, and that when you take everything else away from that, is it wrong to go to Disney World? No. Is it wrong to have them be in sports? Not at all. Those are wonderful gifts. But really, when they start to take over, we've lost the basics of being a parent, which is love your children, teach them about Jesus. Yeah. Um, interesting study that, uh, there are different studies on this, but they're all kind of similar percentages. I've seen a number of them. Um, do you know what percent chance there is for, for kids to go to church and um, Bible class when they're adults? when um, mom and dad, let's say, let's say mom and dad drop the kiddies off for Sunday school and church, and they go on a little date, which that'd be fun, right? That'd be fun to go on a date, but they do that, and they do that on every Sunday. That's when they have their the, them time. Um, do you know what percent chance there is it for that kid when, when that kid goes, grows up to go to church? So it's like five, 20, three, three percent. Three percent chance. Now let's say that, um, that mom says, I'm a dedicated, Christian parent, and I'm going to take my child to Sunday school and, and church, and um, she goes and dad stays home and he watches like, I don't know, pregame NASCAR or something, is that a thing? Like, <laughs> does that exist? Like, what do you, I'm a, there are NASCAR fans that look violently offended right now, I'm sorry, I just don't know what there is, anyway, let's say he stays home and mom takes the, the kid, so when, when the child grows up, what percent chance that the kid's going to be in church and Sunday school? It goes up, yeah, you guys are good, 17%. So there's an impact there, there's a definite impact. Now let's say mom stays home and um, does her nails or whatever, I don't know what girls do, whatever girls do, I'm just kidding, whatever. Um, <laughs> I do actually have nine sisters, I know a lot of what girls do. Um, but let's say she does that and dad takes to Sunday school and church, what percent chance is there that the kid is gonna go to church? This is crazy, 77% chance. Um, again, I, I said that stat in confirmation class once, and a girl said, but that's not fair. I'm like, I am sorry that that's how that works. I am really sorry. That's just how God designed it. Um, but then, here's the key, though. When mom and dad both go, what percent chance is there? Like 97% chance. I mean, it's, it's crazy high. Um, because, it's because you're modeling for them, right? And by the way, I, I always caveat that with this. I owe my faith to my mom. I mean, my dad was a pastor. Um, certainly, he encouraged me in God's word and, and when I would go to church and stuff like that. But the personal stuff, that was all my mom. Um, the, she was the one doing devotions at night because dad was at meetings or in the office. Um, she's the one who said prayers. I've got this, um, I want a Norman Rockwell painting of this. Um, I know that's not possible, but I've got this vision. <laughs> in the morning, my mom would go to bed at like, I think like two in the morning most mornings because you've got like tons of stuff to do, you know. And then she would get up, wake us up at 4.30 in the morning for a paper out, which we would get up, but she wanted to make sure we were up. But that's when she did her devotion. And so I would come in, I just remember that every morning I would come in and it was totally dark, one little light bulb, mom hunched over the counter, Bible open. Just a cool thing, right? Um, so important, so you need both. And, and, and it would never have worked if I didn't have dad's support in that too. Um, so this whole, uh, teaching Jesus, spending a little time on it just because it, it is that that huge. Um, the next two passages, just let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then again he says, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I think that's interesting. Jesus says, unless you change. What does that presuppose? that you have to change, right? That, that all of us could do something here, right? Unless you change and become like little children. Okay, well, what's his point? What is it about little children that we all need to be like? Every, we always think of the trusting thing. And, oh, you, go ahead. You, I don't go know ahead. if I wrote a story. Oh, no, no, okay. But the, that's a simplicity. Yeah, yeah. The trusting thing um, is huge. I, I think... Like our little kids, they will believe everything. Evie will believe anything. Um, I try not to take too much advantage of that, but sometimes <laughs> if I'm having a long day and I'm kind of annoyed, 
And they constantly are like, where's mom, where's mom, where's mom? I'm like, do you ask about me when I'm gone? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. No. Um, and I'll say, oh, she's on the moon. And, and then Evie will be just without skipping a beat. Well, when's she getting back? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, but then, but now the thing is like our spaceship. Now she's figuring it out. She's in kinder, like kindergarten. Um, what's that? First grade. Well, going into first grade. <laughs> going in, the school year's not started. Going into first grade. I know my kids' names and everything. Um, <laughs> so now she's getting into the like. Well, how does mom get to the moon? Well, we have a spaceship underneath our house. Our house actually lifts up and the spaceship comes down. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. She believes that even Dahlia, um, well, you could tell that. You could tell the rock, paper, scissors if you want. But. Oh, the, just that, I just think the simplicity of it all that, you know, for a child, it's just Jesus trumps everything. So my husband has this um, routine that he does some, with some of our kids at the end of the day where he plays rock, rock, paper, scissors. And, you know, they all are super competitive, um, they all want to win, um, but our Evie one night did rock, paper, Jesus, <laughs> because she felt like Jesus would win no matter what he would, so yeah, just just that simplicity and training, you know, that change in us that it all comes down to simply Jesus. Yeah. And th any other things that you can think of with kids, I think there are more applications than just trust. Think about it. What, what about a child? Do we need to be like? Innocence. Innocent, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would love to have that innocent mind again. Just completely what you say I believe, and, and I've got uh, the only thing I can think about is having fun. Like, this is, this is awesome. I'm not mad at you. I just want to have fun. Um, what else? The no fear to tell others about Jesus. Yeah, no fear. Good. Well, the very next Total dependence, right? A child is totally dependent. And Evie never is saying to me, like, oh, thinking that she's something higher than me or more important. No, no, no. Total dependence, total humility, um, sensitive to the message of law and gospel. Um, but just a sponge when it comes to I think all those things are good. But for the sake of time, we should move forward to the next one. Let's do that. Um, oh, I, look at that. I even put a slide together for you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go. There's Evie again. Okay. Um, teaching forgiveness. Um, do you want to go or should I go? I go? Okay. Um, actually, I, this is a small point, but a big point. Actually, have them say, do you, did you do this in your house? Do you do this in your house? Have them say what they're doing. Like if, if somebody hurts you, like you're playing sports, somebody hurts you, um, and they go, oh, I'm sorry, what do you say? That's okay. Really? Is it okay? So, like, so I can do it again? That'd be cool? No, it's not okay. I forgive you, right? Actually saying it. Um, show, them, show them what the biblical word means. Do you know what the biblical, biblical word means? It's beautiful. Um, it means to send away. And, and the picture behind it is the Day of Atonement, um, where everybody, even people, non-Bible people know um, the two goats. Well, the first goat, you know, poor thing, got it. It's throat slit and then sacrifice. But the, the second one, everybody knows. Do you know what it's called? Sweet. Scapegoat. Very good. And, and so the priest would symbolically lay all the sins on the scapegoat's head. And then there was a guy who would take the goat and send it away so that it would never be seen again. That poor little goat. What was God teaching about forgiveness? It's gone, right? As far as the east is from the west, so far I've removed your transgressions from you. How far is the east from the west? So I'm terrible with directions. Is that way east? Which way? That's east? Okay. How far? I knew that. I was testing you. Okay. How far? How far if I keep walking east? How far do I have to go east before I go west? Never going to get there, right? It's infinite, right? And that's what we want to teach our kids. Teach them to say it. And I think it's also kind of cool. We had um, Zoe, our second. Um, I think it was her. It was swimming lessons. We were all the parents sitting on the bleachers and like um, somebody hurt. Zoe, and she said, oh, I'm sorry. And then Zoe said, oh, I forgive you. And the moms all looked at me like, did she just say, I forgive you? 
Like, yeah. And then I got to tell why, and like, I gave him the whole story with like sent away and stuff like that. But a good chance to witness. Anyway, go ahead. Say, say whatever. Practical application for parents. Those of you who saw Dahlia at the beginning, who looks super cute, mm -hmm. that we referred to as a little bit of the devil's <laughs> um, You know, it, whether it's your child, or sometimes it's even with somebody we just know who's close to us, when it's the same thing over and over. Our Dahlia was the one where when she threw a fit, the whole house was gonna come down. And we would have to put her somewhere for safety and she would take everything out of the dresser drawers and take all her clothes off and uh, you know, and all of a sudden it would just be done. And as a parent, that tests your patience, doesn't it? And you forgive them and, and they do it again. And all of a sudden they're 10 and they're still doing it to a point. Um, we get tested, I think, very similarly to as the Lord gets tested with us. That constant forgiveness and um, passage that you have on this one, that how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? No, 77 times seven, right? Um, and I think as parents, oftentimes we find ourselves, I, true confessions, there are times sometimes where my children say, I forgive you, and I go, okay. <laughs> or, you know, they say, I'm sorry, and I go, okay, it's really hard for me to get the words out. I'm not quite there yet, <laughs> and I see lots of nods that I think we've all been there with someone in our life, whether it's our children or someone else we know. Um, but, and I also think it's important not only with our children, but oftentimes with our spouse when we're parenting, that our children see us forgive one another also. I am certainly, although my husband is wonderfully duped, not perfect. <laughs> um, and oftentimes, you know, we do have to say, you know, I'm sorry for something in front of our kids. And to see us being able to model that has been real effective for our children. Good? Good? Yeah. All right, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. That was good. Oh, we just wanted to show you this picture just because we think it's great. This is like favorite picture ever. I think this is you taking a picture of a picture. Uh -huh. Right? So this is Stassi, our oldest. And this is Zoe. And that's why she's crying. The nooker is down there. Oh. So. <laughs> And this is terrible father who said, ooh, this is awesome. Stassi, put your arm around her and smile. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get it's this. Just, it's hilarious because this picture shows they are still like this today. Stassi is this kind of a child, and Zoe is this kind of a child, and they are now 15 and 13. <laughs> Last week, we actually made up a word. We're calling it, so it's Zoe, it's drama, drama, it's drama. Zoe drama. And she totally owns it. She's like, I know. <laughs> okay. Um, tip number three, repent. Admit when you're wrong, which is really tough when you're always right. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, I think the number one way to teach your kids to be stubborn, and I, I think I've seen this more and more as I've, I've been in ministry and dealt with people um, who are unable to say sorry, to own their own, excuse, or own, their own fault, Boy, an awful lot of the time, guess why that is? It's because they have a dad or a mom, or even worse, both, who can't admit when they're wrong. Um, number, way, number one way to make your kid stubborn is to be stubborn. Um, absolutely, uh, 100%. So like the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, you know that passage? I used to struggle with that a little bit when I, uh, um, when I was younger because I was like, well, no, God doesn't punish kids for their parents' sins, but now I totally get that. Um, how do you teach your kid to be stubborn? Well, be stubborn. And then guess what? Your grandkids are going to be stubborn too. And then their, grand, their kids, and th that kind of thing. So uh, just the idea of, of being able to admit when you're wrong in the Proverbs passage, he who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them um, finds, or finds mercy. Um, I had, sorry, one last thing and you talk. I had marriage counseling with um, a woman uh, and, and a guy. Uh, he was there too. And they had had this awful fight where they were just both ridiculous. They, they were both in the wrong. They were both ridiculous. And the, the wife was a very, really, a really meek woman. And, and she said, you know, especially for the sake of peace, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I should not have been like that and all that kind of stuff. And then we're just both kind of looking at the guy. <laughs> and finally, she says, well, aren't you going to say you're sorry? And he said, why would I say sorry? I didn't do anything wrong. Oh. I prayed for that lady that night. 
that's tough. Um, we don't want our kids to be like that either, right? Um, and so owning what, owning what we do, letting them see, I'm not perfect, um, and I can actually admit it, and I can actually say sorry for it. Go on. Right, so a couple weeks ago, I'm in the kitchen cleaning up, and I hear Isaiah and Zoe who are in the kitchen, and Zoe, Zoe drama, says this comment to Isaiah. Mom and Dad like to discipline us by telling us how perfect they were as children, but I don't learn like that. <laughs> so I proceeded to tell her what a perfect child I was. And, um, you know, it, that hit me uh, in a couple different ways. And it made me reflect on, is that what I do? Do I always point out their shortcomings and balance it with how good I was as a child? Like, I would never do that. I would never have said that. And that can oftentimes be the difficult thing as a parent because there are times when you can balance it like that. Where you say, where you think to yourself, I, this is something I learned and I, my children don't need to know that I've you know, done this wrong. Um, but there are times where it is okay to share with them, you know what, I've been in the same shoes you have been or I have made this mistake before and this is what I learned. Um, so that was a little bit of a smack in the face <laughs> from Zoe, and we had a discussion about respectful speaking <laughs> after that. Um, but yeah, just, and like my husband said, and kind of coming off that first comment, that it is okay to model that um, as, uh, as spouses and as parents with your children, that sometimes, sometimes I come home from a long day, for a long time I was a child care director, and if any of you are teachers or worked with children for a long time, raise your hand if you have been child care directors or teachers or whatnot. Yep. Sometimes, and then you come home to your own kids. And it's just never ending and it's wonderful, but sometimes it's exhausting and your patience is short when you get home with your own kids. And there are times at the end of the day where I've had to say, I'm sorry, I just took out a long day on, on you and I shouldn't have done that. And that's okay. You know, we shouldn't feel that that's a shortcoming on our end. That's a great modeling for our children. Awesome. All right, number four. Um, discipline. The father disciplines those he loves. Hebrews 12, no discipline is pleasant at the time, but produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Um, you need, need discipline. What do you call a kid who's never been disciplined? Spoiled. Tell me the truth. Have you known any spoiled? <laughs> like, as adults, have you ever known a spoiled adult? Oh, yes. Are they not... Sorry, awful to be around? Like, yes, what? we don't, what? <laughs> I think I'm just fine. No, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, but it's true, it's true, right? And, and so discipline, uh, discipline our children, it's, it's very, very, very necessary. Um, whether you, I'll let Beth talk about that, the different, it's amazing how different kids respond to different discipline, but the, my point, my main point with this one is whether you spank or you give timeouts or you redirect, um, whatever that is, um, <laughs> or you're polite, but no thank you when they're doing something, you know, or not saying no, whatever you do, I'm not judging. You can see where I fall, I fall on one end. Um, it is child abuse when you don't share the gospel with them. That's when it's child abuse. I'm, I'm saying, obviously, you can go too far. That's not what I'm saying. Well, what I'm saying is discipline without rooting it in the forgiveness that Jesus won for us. Um, is doing your child a disservice. Uh, because that is your whole goal, to show the heart of the Father um, who loves him. So maybe you can, I'll let you talk. Um, so our children all discipline very differently. <laughs> our oldest child, Anastasia, is the quintessential oldest, responsible, wants to follow all the rules. If you look at her with this face, she will absolutely break down. Um, so for her, that was our discipline. <laughs> You know, we looked at her. She had a spot she had to sit on, and that, that was effective. <laughs> Zoe <laughs> and Dahlia <laughs> and Nika, who are our three more challenging ones, are not that way. I could have looked at Zoe. I could have set her in a chair. She could have cared less. Um, so we had to find other ways to deal with them, always loving and always including the gospel in there. The tricky thing is, and maybe you can think of times that this has happened to you or someone you know is when they figure out that you're doing it different. Why is it that you do this to them but you don't do that to me? But they're not quite old enough to figure out why it is. You can give them the answer but they don't quite have the life experience to understand why you do that. Um, and that is the wonderful 
opportunity for you to be able to share that gospel message too, that God made us all different. And what a blessing. We don't want you to be this child or that child. We want you to be you. And he gave us that great gift to be able to train you and bring you up in the way that you need. Not in the way that Anastasia needs or not in the way that Isaiah needs, but in the way that you need. Um, but that can be very tricky as a parent because I, as one, am a parent where if it doesn't work the first time or it worked for the first child and didn't work for the second child, I think that I have just become the worst parent in the world. I don't know what has happened. I've gone to the internet. I'm watching Super Nanny to give me answers. <laughs> and, um, and that's where reliance on your spouse, too, to stick to your plan when it comes to discipline, that you're always on the same page so that whatever happens with your child, they know they're going to get the same answer from either of you is really important. And just remember to, that at the end of the day, go to the Lord in prayer, too, because some of those situations can be very hard. Because when they're small and they're four, you're dealing with the fact that somebody just took, you know, a whole can of, what did, it, what did I say it take? Oh, you know, um, all-purpose cleaner. It went like this in the living room, all over the furniture and the carpet right before you had company. Um, and when you have teenagers, you're dealing with somebody got their heart broken or a friend just abandoned them for one reason or another. Um, and that is the, the glorious thing of being able to always use God's word to help them, help them in those ways. You stepped on number seven. Oh, I'm not sorry. criticizing. No. I'm not <laughs> criticizing. <laughs> Disciplinary action. Uh, this might seem like a weird one, but um, teach them to give that on the first day of every week, First Corinthians says, each one of you should set aside a sum of money. Each one. Who? Well, that's everybody, right? Um, including kids, as we've been blessed, so we give. Um, our pattern with our children, they all know it, um, is that when they're young and they don't have money, uh, we pull out the dollar bills for them um, so that they can put something in the plate, and then all of them know, know the routine. Um, I will call one of them over to my, me, and I'll say, who are you going to give that to? And at first, they always point at the guy with the plate and go, that guy. <laughs> um, no, okay, then they figure out Jesus. That's the right answer. That's what Dad's looking for. And then why are you going to give it to Jesus? Because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. You can try to train them, right? Um, and by the way, you have to keep training them because uh, now twice this summer, Evie has said to me, when I say, why do you want to give it to Jesus? She said, so that we can go to heaven. I'm like, no, 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 that's not, that's not it. Um, it's because he died for us. Um, but anyway, it's beautiful. Kids, again, becoming like a little child, kids can teach us something. Uh, when Nika, our youngest, gets $5 from grandma and grandpa for her birthday, and I say, how much do you want to give to Jesus? What does she say? All of it. And then I feel like the really bad parent who goes, oh, sweetie, you don't have to give all of it. <laughs> of course, that's awesome. But here's the point. Why does she want to give all of it? Because she implicitly trusts me. She has never wanted for anything. I, we give her everything that she needs. Um, isn't that kind of a cool thing? Like, can we kind of be like that with our Father in Heaven too? Yeah? And how quickly we grow out of it? So Stassi, just this summer, she had a babysitting job, made $15, and we talk about, you know, we, we do 10% to church, 10% for spending, and the rest in the savings. And so I say to Stassi, 15 bucks, how much are you gonna give to church? A dollar. Well, why are you only giving a dollar? Well, I rounded. I'm like, <laughs> pretty sure you round up. That's what you're supposed to do. Anyway, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Our Evie had a lemonade stand this week. It's really cute because we live smack across from the Catholic Church, so we, we secretly dub it as a family to the Lutheran lemonade stand across the street. Um, and she, Dave came and asked her, you know, did you make some money? And she told him how much she had made, and he said, well, you want to give that to Jesus? So she held it up in the air. <laughs> and then, then looked at him and said, he didn't take it. <laughs> but she was willing. She was willing. <laughs> But the other aspect we do want to hit on with, um, you know, teach them to give is not only of your gifts of money, but also your gifts of time. When your church or community has, you have those opportunities to um, volunteer or be a part of things that are happening. Um, don't do it just as spouses, but involve your children and be excited about it. Say, this is a way that we can help um, when your children are older and they can help at a Christmas for kids or an Easter for kids or a food shelf and they can go do those things, not even just for 
um, accruing them on a sheet for school or something, but because they truly want to. Um, I know a lot of people will do that at Christmas sometimes. After years, they'll say, instead of gifts this year, we're going to do a family service project instead. Um, those are neat ways that you can brainstorm with your family. And it can be as small as even a family bucket list. I know sometimes we do summer bucket lists of what we can do as a family in ways that we can volunteer in our church and our community. That's another way that we can really teach our children to give. All right, so number six. Um, What's that? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm getting like oh, we're sorry. gonna. We built this in. This is great. All right. Oh, I had another. Mm, cup, sorry. Isn't this true though? Right. Our biblical priority. Um, you could probably debate on the taxes family one, but <laughs> Uncle Sam is kind of upset if he doesn't get his money. Um, but anyway, how quickly we flip everything around. So like, um, you know, God taxes family. Those are your responsibilities with your money. Far and away, the, the least is everything else, including your hobbies, vacation. I put in like big house, nice food, and you're going, no, a house is part of your needs. Uh, how much of a house, right? In the, in the 1950s, what was the average size house? 1,000 square feet. 1970s, 1,500 square feet. 1990s, 2,000 square feet. Today, 2,662 square feet. What happened? Did we get bigger? <laughs> No, right? So it's, it's, um, it's part of everything else, but how quickly this becomes the main thing and it, the devil flips it on its head. Unless we teach our kids what priorities are, what, what they should be, they're never going to be content in life. And tr quite frankly, I don't care if my kids have a dime to their name. I want them to be content. Um, that's the most important thing to me uh, when, when it comes to this area. Okay, so te I'll teach them again. All right. Live your faith with outreach. Um, we designed a cliffhanger in here. If you get nothing out of this, you may win fabulous prizes. We both work at MLC now. Oh, you didn't tell them that. Okay. You just started at MLC yesterday. Two days in. Yep, so she is the administrative assistant in mission advancement, right? Yep. So it's awesome. Anyway, very nice mugs. You might win these. I've got a quiz for you. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna set up the quiz Oh, this is us at Truck or Treat. Oh, volunteering, outreach. yeah. Yeah, so we don't normally dress like that, but it was for... <laughs> Our theme was sleepover. So sleepover. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to give you this quiz. You have to, well, at least mentally have something in your head. Why did they belong, or why did they belong to the church? Why did they join the church? This is not a well survey, so otherwise it would be, the big number would be there, right? Because of previous loyalties to that denomination which is awesome, by the way, that's a huge blessing. Um, but it's not a well survey, so I'm giving you a hint. Um, because the pastor visited them, because a friend or relative invited them, because they trained lay member visited them because of the church's location or building. You've got three, nine, 14, 18, 56. You gotta put those in the right order. Do you wanna try it? Some of you have pens. Otherwise you can mentally put it in your head. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds here. I'm gonna show you a little video that'll give you a hint and then we'll finish this point after a break. Is that okay? All right. All right, you ready for your hint? Okay. This is this has to do with outreach, um, and it does have to do with this particular exercise and this particular point. I probably don't need to show this video, but it's a little comic relief for you. Here you go. Oh, no. That was, that was a fast video. Evangelism is not for the weak. All right, I should know. I wrote a whole book about it. Self-published. Most Christians, they are just good for bake sales and potluck dinners. But I'm telling you this right now. It takes a lot of moxie to grab a non-believer by the shirt collar and throw him to the front doors of a church and say, Hey, try to live out your heathen life in front of a holy God that way. It is like holy water in a vampire. That's the divine intervention, is right? Repent for the kingdom of the Lord is known. Come to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
Well, sir, it sounds like you're really passionate about Jesus. I am. Um, and you should also be. Okay. Passionate about the Lord. Sir, if there's... You need to get sanctified or chicken fried. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get with the Lord or drive a Ford. I share my faith. Okay, that's a lie. People don't even know I'm a Christian. I want to. Again, another lie. I hardly shower, much less have the will to do anything else. Okay. Now, if there was pizza and ice cream every time there was faith sharing, I'd do it. That's a lie. I'm not close and taller. Okay, another lie. I'm just too cheap to buy dairy. Bottom line, sharing my faith makes me sweaty. Uh, tip number 95, um, use big church words like transubstantiation. Heathens get confused easily, and the more confused they are, the more ashamed they are. The more ashamed they are, the more apt they are to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Uh, I believe it's a responsibility, no, the privilege, no, the glorious privilege of every believer to share their faith with others. That's why I share my faith with everyone I come in contact with. Everyone, really? <laughs> yeah, everyone. How do you do that? Uh, check out my shirt. Can't read it? Try this glove. Not working for you? How about this bracelet? No comprendo? Distanzo a estos. <laughs> Driving behind me? Read my bumper sticker. It says, it's okay if you follow close. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> oh, you're my waiter or waitress? I got a tip for you. Surprise! It's the gospel. I mean, what do you want? Money or eternity? <laughs> I also use these tracks. <laughs> so, what about talking to people about your faith? I, I don't really like people. You know, I don't like Jesus. Speak for me? Hello, my name is George. And I'm Jorge. And together we're George and Jorge. Right, right. And what we'd like to do is to take secular songs and reprogram them. Yes. The purpose is for evangelism. We like to take songs to the unbelieving world and make it believable. Right, right. Let us give you a sample right now. Oh my goodness. 